Our next presenter is Nigel Phillips. Um, I asked Nigel for a bio, bio on himself and he said, just say I work for the department and the CSIRO for the last 30 years doing research. So there's Nigel for you. Research slash extension. So um, I guess while well, I've got two topics I want to talk about today and depending how much time I get, we'll get through both of them. But my first one is fossils, which has been a bit of a pet topic for me for the last couple of years. Uh, as also as the agronomist at Wagga, it's probably been 80% of my phone calls during the drought were about how do I manage phosphorus, how do I cut it back, how can I do it more efficiently. Uh, a lot of my experience recently has been in the pastoral world, but a lot of lessons transfer across over the cropping. So what I want to do is uh, get back to a bit of practical stuff and say, OK, well, let's look at phosphorus as an issue and let's try and look at ways we can better manage it in a practical sense. In 2009, the University of Technology in Sydney published a report estimating that the demand for global phosphorus uh, would exceed supply in 25 to 30 years. Uh, that was very concerning to funding bodies and farmers and a whole bunch of people around the globe and the fertiliser industry. Uh, and essentially what's driving that is there's a lot of countries, Kazakhstan, even uh, really good soil countries uh, in those eastern bloc, open up eastern blocks, have enormous potential to amalgamate land masses into larger parcels and farm them on a much more intensive basis than they do now. So, and country that was previously never used phosphate, uh, like my uncle up north who's never used super in his life, till last year. So a lot of country that's been very uh, favourable for phosphorus is starting to reach its uh, limit where they may need to use inputs as well. So that was quite alarming. It prompted a, a much more detailed reassessment of that, which was a bit more reassuring, which really said that the reserves are probably at least four times uh, greater than that previous report. Uh, but nevertheless, it highlights an issue, depending on your time frame, if you want to talk about our lifetime or our great-grandkids' lifetime, uh, phosphorus will become limiting at some point in the future. And as we approach that point and the sources we mine become harder and more expensive to mine now, uh, the costs will go up. Currently in Australia, about 50% of the phosphorus we apply on farms uh, comes from imported sources. Uh, so that's an issue for us, and, and that'll get a bit of greater context later on. The other thing that we talk about a lot recently is phosphorus use efficiency, much like water use efficiency. Uh, I mean, basically in agriculture, generally, about a quarter of the phosphorus we put out uh, ends up in the products we take off the farm. The rest gets locked up within the system. And uh, this is part of the opportunity, but also just part of the system we have to deal with. And there's a wide range in that. So, you know, some of the horticultural operations can be down as low as 5%, quite inefficient. Some of the cropping ones are more typically up around 40 or 40 to 50%. But there's a huge range in there. And in uh, those uh, soils or those different coloured sands that call soils in Western Australia. Uh, there are systems over there which are much more efficient uh, because they're, they're either very low input or they're very low phosphorus sorbing or holding onto phosphorus in those soils. Uh, but that's a bit different over here. The other thing to keep in the back of your mind is that if we're talking about recycling nutrients across the system, basically about 90% of the phosphorus that we produce in agricultural products gets exported overseas. So even if we got all our sewage back and, and all the organic waste back uh, recycled in the farming systems, you know, 90% is still going overseas. And uh, so, you know, we are essentially mining and exporting phosphorus in our wheat and our cattle and everything else. And that's just part of agriculture and it's the same internationally everywhere else. So there's some of the drivers behind uh, the need for us to improve our efficiency of use and try and spin those reserves out as long as we possibly can uh, Will that be infinite? Possibly not, but I won't be around to see the end of that one. But we need to start setting up the science that will drive that into the future. Just quickly, don't get too hung up on the numbers about this, but I've put this up here just to give us a context about phosphorus use efficiency and how it fits in. So this is a pasture example. You know, basically put out 10 kilograms of phosphorus. That's uh, about 110 kilograms of single super. We put that on the paddock. Basically, only about a kilo of that will drive past the growth in the year you put it out. A bit of rub around these figures, but roughly about that proportion. About four kilos of that 
will probably drive past the growth over the next three to four years. But half of that will go into the soil and get fixed long term uh, in, in iron complexes and aluminium complexes. And uh, this is one of the nutrients we've studied the most, and it's still exceedingly complicated. Uh, the lesson for me are a couple. One is that we have this increasing pool of soil that's quite big compared to what we put on. We need about 24 kilograms of phosphorus coming out of this pool on an annual basis to drive the 10 tonnes of pasture growth that this system lives on. So the reality is, is that most of the phosphorus driving production this year is not coming from the super you apply, it's coming from the cycling out of this pool. So in effect, your job is to manage this pool. Okay? So one of the things that is difficult for us is that we seem to be increasing the size of this pool and not getting it released, uh, not within a time frame that we find acceptable for production, certainly not in the cropping system where that's an annual turnaround. When does this locked up pea come out? Could be next year, could be next 50 years, I don't know, but we can't build a production system based on that. We just can't get it to come out when we want it to. About nine kilos goes through the system and comes out and about a kilo in this system is sold off farm. And what a soil test is, it's not an exact measure of this, it's essentially a dipstick measure of this. Uh, so it tells us is that if our dipstick says it's high, we probably have roughly this amount coming out which will drive this growth this year. And that's what a soil test is doing for us. It's not measuring the total pool, it's measuring what's coming out of it. Almost. So can we improve phosphorus use efficiency? There's a couple of projects, I know MLA and GDC both have areas where they're looking at uh, trying to find more phosphorus efficient plants. Things like lupins have a proteoid root, so a root goes out then branches out normally and it's a really good system to capture sparse sources of phosphorus. Cereals with their fibrous root system are much better at capturing phosphorus than taprooted plants like legumes. Uh, there are a range of potentials. So for example in the clover we have a big germplasm of uh, subclover and other clovers and one of the things we want to do is go back to that germplasm bank and say can we find little subspecies with this or species in this that are more phosphorus, phosphorus efficient than the ones we currently have on the market. Until we do the work we don't know. Uh, if we do that we might find a genetic marker for that then we can just screen material and say it doesn't have that, that characteristic. So that work's happening. There's work happening with uh, rhizosphere reactions, you know, plants that you know, put out extra dates that dissolve phosphorus and therefore make it more available. There's work on uh, mycorrhizal fungi and symbiotic relationships. Uh, the reality is that that work is such early days, and listen to Daniel's talk earlier, I mean, you know, soil biology we know so little about. Uh, maybe the stuff is functioning to the level, the maximum level we can expect now. So, this is future work, and uh, I don't know of too many things apart from perhaps rhizobium in the nitrogen f uh, field where we've got really good data that this stuff is good and reliable and significant. We can find a lot of stuff that works, but you know, if it only adds one kilogram of nitrogen or one kilogram of phosphorus per year, is it really useful to us? Um, some of the organic guys talk about pH adjustments, so if we get that pH up into that uh, towards neutral zone, we get less phosphorus locked up in uh, iron complexes and therefore more available to plants. But it's a bit of swing and roundabout because we know if you're using rock phosphate in those organic systems, that rock phosphate becomes available because this soil acidity breaks that rock phosphate down to release the pea. So it swings and roundabouts with these. There's a uh, so whole bunch of work happening on new fertiliser technologies, both about placement and about coating of it so that it doesn't get released and locked up before a plant gets a chance to get to it. That work's ongoing internationally. And there are some uh, interesting things that might come out in the next few years. We might look at pea efficient rotations. And in cropping systems, one of the things I was seeing a lot of stratification, you know, the phosphorus just sitting on the surface. Uh, and, you know, do we want to cultivate periodically to move that down to where roots might capture it? And in really dry systems west of here, you know, where the soil moisture at the surface is dry for a lot of the year, you might have plenty of phosphorus up there, but it's never soluble because it's hardly ever wet. So part of the thing is looking at efficient rotations and efficient systems. And again, early work. Uh, we've got ideas where we can go. Does anyone have any true answers in this area, any of those areas for me yet? I don't see enough evidence to make me want to change big things on my farm just yet. So what I want to talk about quickly in FOSS is about 
there's a great opportunity for us to adopt current best management practice. And it's surprising, uh, you know, how much gain we can make there using essentially 1970s, 80s and 90s technology uh, that hasn't been fully adopted or hasn't been fully adopted in the context we want to want our farms. Just quickly, so most of our soils are naturally deficient in phosphorus. There are some areas which aren't. My uncle thought he was one of those, but he was wrong. Uh, legumes have a higher requirement of phosphorus. This is important in the pasture game. Uh, so this is, don't read that as anything particular coal, we'll just look at the relatively. So essentially down at the bottom end, you know, we see all our grasses, which have a fibrous root system, which are more efficient at capturing phosphorus. And then we start moving into some broad leaves, but you know, not all of our grasses are sufficient. Right at the top are things like sub clover and white clover. And even barley grass isn't that much different. So the difference between here and here is quite substantial in the upper limit of phosphorus that they can maximum, maximise production at. But they may not be as productive by the same token either. So in general, the fibrous root system drives the difference between legumes and most grasses, but there is a range of this material. And I guess the legume is important for us because it, it's one of the few mechanisms we know where we can fix nitrogen out of the air. Uh, and if we want to maximise that, we want to get about 20 to 25 kilograms of nitrogen fixed per tonne of legume we grow in a pasture. Uh, but to do that, we have to have the phosphorus to maximise growth. This slides up here. This is some of some data I'm about to publish. So this comes out of a course called Landstone. This is soil tests across uh, New South Wales. And this is just the phosphorus component. And this slide is about the dangers of amalgamating data and drawing broad conclusions. So what do we have here? Uh, we have a box plot of all the soil tests in this entire data set. That's the upper limit, that's the lower limit. This box represents 50% and this solid line across the middle is the mean. The average is slightly above it. This dotted line going across it is the fertility index. So what we've done is say, what is the required soil level for the, the type of soil you have to get 95% of maximum production, which is generally the most economic point to aim for. And so with this data set, you turn around and say, if you just took the mean saying, you know, or average, on average, our soils are being over fertilised. But there's nearly as many points below it as above it. But if you look at this data set, you go, hell, this guy is 10 times what he needs to be for 95% of maximum production. Some guys are even higher. That's probably 70 times. So there is opportunity for people up here to cut back. There is maybe a need for these people to build up, but keeping in mind is that some of these might be appropriately low. They might be pasture paddocks on western slopes of hills with no water over summer, that there's no point driving growth there because you cannot capture it through your animal system. So that's the whole data set. When you look at the broader data set split down, it's a very different story. And this is a story about making sure you look at information with an appropriate context. So all of these are included in this. And what we see is some stark differences between what look like agroclimatic zones but are really, in fact, industry use. So if we go to central tablelands, the bulk, 75% or more than 75%, of soils in that area. So this is a data set that is relatively current. So it's 2009 to 2012, relatively recent data. Uh, most of these things you would say are well below. The, the average is about half what it should be uh, for phosphorus. So you would say that a lot of this group here have, you know, it, it'd be hard for me to believe that most of these people are appropriately below. Uh, so there's potential for these guys to build up and improve productivity. If I look at the dairy set, this is dairies all up and down the East Coast. They're way high. And these guys have significant opportunity to cut right back for most of the paddocks we tested. So Hunter, a dairy set. North Coast, a dairy set. Central Tablelands is essentially a broad acre grazing enterprise. Northern Tablelands, a bias below. A broad scale grazing enterprise. Central Slopes and Plains, a mixed farming system. What we're seeing is the influence of cropping pushing it up over the line. South Coast, this is a, a non-dairy set, so this is uh, the rougher country in the South Coast, so opportunity to potentially build up. 
Southern Tableland, huge range, but on the whole, there's potential to put more out and improve productivity. And if we want to increase our carbon, we can. one of the ways we know we can do it is improve productivity by deleting uh, an issue raised by nutrient deficiency like phosphorus in the Sydney and Southern Highlands. So, so I got really alarmed when I saw some data coming out of the West, which looked at all the stuff in a particular catchment, did a big thing like this and said, and the, the journalist got this article and said, farmers are over fertilising. And I said, no, they're not. Some guys are, some guys aren't. And within that, you will have a different message for different segments of your market. Does that make sense? So the point is that, you know, going to, say, the website and looking at uh, where you are relative to a big mass data, you've got to be very careful how you interpret it. And, and there needs to be some, a lot of thought about doing that. And if this phosphorus test is 10 years old, is it even valid anymore? If it's carbon, we're as slow as change, it might be. But if it's nitrogen, it's probably, it's probably worth about three weeks. So you really be careful with context around your data. This is another data set, a little bit older. So it captures a lot of uh, the middle of the drought and it's mostly cropping zone stuff, and a lot of these tests are from down here. Uh, basically, most of this mixed farming zone are fairly close to the mark. Uh, a couple of pasture guys have overdone it, because I know there's a couple of dairies in this set from the Upper Murray. Uh, but they're much better at managing it in cropping zones, probably because they crop. This is another data set. So this is from the Murray in particular. And look, essentially, you know, the right hand dark blue is guys who are over fertilising, guys who are slightly over fertilising, probably about right, under, you know, a bit too low and very low. And we see as we move from east, we have a greater proportion of paddocks that are, we would consider low in phosphorus. And as we move in the cropping zone, it flips around the other way. And that's no real surprise. That's what I've seen on all my data sets. So again, it's about the context. If your message is that people are over fertilising, maybe in some parts of the catchment, so the line here is about, that's about how long here. Uh, in the east, different story, but what's it like? I mean, this is flat. This is probably 60, 70% cropping. This is getting more and more livestock in the system and highly variable, steeper and steeper landscape. Uh, some of this country may not be worth fertilising or maybe not economic to do, do so. So again, it's about looking at your data in an appropriate context before you make a decision. So back to my hobby horse about testing. So I mean, it's very difficult to uh, effectively manage salt if you don't know where you're at. So soil testing for me is a really important answer. If you're trying to calculate it, and God knows I've tried this, it's actually really difficult. I mean, your current P status is an accumulated history of what's gone on, what's come off. And to try and run that over years and seasons is difficult. So you don't bother, you just soil test. We probably all remember a few years ago some continent articles saying where they sent a sample divided up to a whole bunch of labs and got a whole bunch of different answers, and we still see that, and they seem to be variable. But what I want to talk about in a second is maybe a process that can take a lot of this variability out, and it's not perfect, but it gets you in a position where you can make practical, intelligent, phosphorus management decisions uh, and be comfortable with it, and that accounts for some of this variability. How good are farmers at doing it? Not that good. So this is, a couple, this is two groups I've done with. So we've got the blue diamonds are guys who are basically graziers and the red uh, triangles are people who are croppers. And basically the closer you are to this line, the better you are at guessing. And some of these people are way out, way out. The croppers tend as a group to be better. Why? They do more soil tests. Less than 15% of the soil tests so our samples submitted to labs nationally come from pastures. Pasture guys have not really adopted soil testing as a practical management tool compared to cropping guys. But I know some of these cropping guys, uh, one guy, actually one guy here is really close in his crop paddock, but he's up here in his pasture paddock. And that just tells you, he knows his cropping paddocks really well, he does not, he's guessing about his pasture paddocks. And in this case, a lot of these guys have lots of pea reserves because they're underestimating the phosphorus in this, in this paddock. Uh, in this case, they're overestimating it. So I thought that was a really interesting bit of data that time. Uh, and you know who's worse than the farmers? The advisors. 
Uh, and because the advisors don't have the capacity generally to put a local context on that paddock, is it a high productive paddock, is it not? They just see a soil test that often they may not even be in the paddock. Uh, some advisors are spot on, but generally not as good as farmers. So around the soil testing, you know, for me, to get a lot of this variability out of the process, you have to make it repeatable. Uh, and I'm saying you, know, you take it at the same time of year to take climatic, you know, well, seasonal variation out of the picture under similar moisture conditions under the same way every year to take as much of that variability out as you possibly can. Uh, paddocks can be highly variable, particularly as we move east. Uh, and I found it often more useful to, uh, you know, if you've got a small party of paddocks, a, a different soil type, but the bulk of your production comes from this one soil type, I'd probably just sample the, the one that represents the bulk of the production from that paddock, be it crop or pasture. And in a pasture area, you know, you may even turn around and say, look, these four paddocks in the flats are all loosened, they've got a similar soil type, I know they're roughly the same cold water level, instead of taking a sample in every paddock every year, uh, I'm going to sample one which represents management across the zone because they get pretty much the same removal rate because they get the same amount of grazing. So you need to make some decisions. And farmers are actually surprisingly good at doing this when you get a framework for thinking. Uh, one of the places I work up near Baldry with, they just decided the cost of soil testing was so small compared to their investment in the fertiliser, they just test every paddock every year and be done with it. And that's the other thing is testing every year. If you wait five years, to see if things have changed, you may have missed an important management point. Uh, so I like to do it annually. I want to use the same test. In this New South Wales is general coal wall P. It could be Olsen. It could eventually be the DGT test. Uh, but you want consistency of the test. And what I want you to do is plot this data and manage a trend over time. So instead of making a decision based on this soil test on this day, I want you to look at the entire set of data and make a decision based on that to avoid those anomalies we get in soil testing. And again, be careful about changing labs. I mean, on the whole, that whole issue of lab variability has been dealt with. Uh, there's a really good program by the Fertilizer Agency to bring those all in the line. So you want a good NADA uh, or ASPAC accredited lab, and you're probably not going to get much variation between labs, but I generally do a crossover test if I'm changing labs. The last couple of years, I've been advocating zone sampling. So what I mean by zone sampling, in the past we would have done a random sample, we would have taken our 30 or 40 cores by randomly zigzagging across the paddock and just taking those cores, bulking them together and submitting that as a test. We then move to a transect, we say I'll move from this point to that point uh, and I'll take my 30 or 40 cores along that, bulk them together, send it off. And I thought, geez that's a lot of work and I said I reckon I can, if you pick a really good spot in the paddock that's pretty typical for the bulk of it uh, and you know, is it representative you know, I am only worse off. And the guys at Holbrook, God bless them, didn't trust me. So they went out and did this trial. And effectively they found no real difference in the real world uh, between the PBI, phosphorus buffering index, or the coal well. So why do I favour zone sampling? I don't think it's anything better than anything else. I think you just change one set of uh, issues for another set of issues. But I'm comfortable that in real world sampling for real farmers, it is a useful system, and I know I can get you to do it. You put a GPS point out, you turn around and say, here's my GPS point, I don't feed out stuff here, uh, it's typical for bulk of the paddock, uh, and I will take my cores within maybe 20 or 30 metre radius of that spot, and I can go back to it every year. I can give that GPS to my consultant and say, you go do it for me. And I know it will be the same, it will take that spatial variability out of the equation. So when you look at some of the work by Mark Conyers is looking at spatial variability of phosphorus results even within a trial plot, it's horrendous. So I just kind of get over the fact that it's variability and I try and minimise it at every step that I can. And this one's about repeatability. Happy with that? So simple, practical, easy to do, GPS technologies in your phone. All right, so here's what I want you to kind of do is start looking at some of these. So, this is some data from Richard Simpson at CSIRO, and what he's done is taken a whole bunch of soil samples over time. The red ones represent this, the same time of year. Check out the variation within years. Right. Fertilising, bang, up it goes. Crop drawdown, crop drawdown. Fertilise, bang, up it goes. So if you sample within two or three months of fertilising, you'll think you're doing pretty well, but you actually might be way down here. If you sample, 
constantly at the bottom end, you're probably, it's probably a safer decision point. But what you want to really say is, look, let's not try and uh, worry too much about getting bottom. Let's just get a consistent period. Now, for my mind in pastures, the best time is late winter, early spring. I don't want, I want two or three months after I put super out. It's going to be easy to sample because I'm banged a lot of uh, soil samples in February and it was really hard work and drought. Uh, and often I didn't quite get good depth because of that. Um, so I got consistent soil moisture. So basically that late July, early August, soil moisture conditions are generally consistent across a big run of years. Sampling is easy. And once I'm getting up into this zone up here, the timing is, becomes a little less relevant to me. And what I'm not mentioning, I'm not making any decisions on fertiliser based on any individual point. I'm basing it on the trend line running through this data, which means I have to have at least three or four points to draw a trend line, which means if I only sample once every five or six years, I'll be retiring before I get a trend line. And that's not really active management for me. All right? So that's what's driving behind the principle I think we should be adopting in our, our pasture systems. Uh, what do we target? Our target's going to depend on which soil test we use, where you're at now, whether you want to drop it down, build it up or maintain it, what your production goals are. This is very important for the pasture world. You know, we had the, uh, the Triple P program a few years ago where it's basically pushing the max. You know, a lot of farmers got very uncomfortable, especially after drought, about constantly pushing towards maximum productivity. You might be more comfortable and sometimes more profitable in being below it. But it's got to be an educated decision, not just a, like a lot of guys in the Central West have clearly done. Their decision was, super is a cost, let's stop supering. And there wasn't really consideration for uh, outcome and the financials. So just quickly in terms of tests, roughly there's a difference between tests because the Olsen and the coal well, I mean, really it's about extraction time. So some tests like the calcium chloride really measured just the readily available phosphorus, the DGT, a little bit more of the medium, and the coal wells out here. And that's why you get difference between the tests and you can't always relate between them. So in 2007, the pastor guys got together and ran this project, uh, and they started mapping up all the response trials for phosphorus and saying, what is the critical coal well or Olsen for these things? So for Olsen, they found, we just kind of shotgun the results, that 15 was the magic number, or between 14 and 17. So for an Olsen test, you're aiming for 95% of maximum pasture production. You want about 15 Olsen. They did the same thing for coal well, then convenient for me graphed up the other way around, but it's the same data. And they found that they could actually, because coal pulls out more background or medium term uh, phosphorus, they could actually pull out that clay content Daniel was talking about had influence. And they ended up with this. And so basically, depending on your phosphorus buffering index, your critical value changed. Right? And there's a range, because there's a range in PBI as well. And these are the targets for 95% of maximum pasture production legume-based pastures. In the cropping world, there's currently a project doing the same thing. This is a little bit of stuff coming out of the better fertiliser cropping now. And surprisingly, I thought they might have been higher, but the critical levels for 95% don't appear to be too much different from what I'm seeing for pastures, which is kind of pleasing. Um, early days in that, but hopefully we'll start to develop that previous table based on the cropping data. So there's hundreds and hundreds of research trials on that. So we're starting to fill the gaps out and maybe populate this a bit of work. For cropping world, we can plot PBI against critical coal well and give you the best level to target. So in a system, we'll decide where we want to be and we'll try and get ourselves into that zone and manage a trend to stay in that zone. It'll bounce around a bit, but your aim is to keep the trend within your zone. Building beyond that doesn't increase production. Going below it, will have reduced production, but may be an economically viable option. Do not discount that. Uh, you need to have a good plan to decide where you sit on that, but be careful about going too low, particularly in pasture circumstances, because you might drop your legumes out. And if you're trending up, you're putting too much out. And if you're trending down, you're not putting out enough. Simple, simple, practical, reasonable data behind it, and I think I can get people to adopt it and improve their efficiency, especially some of those guys who are way up there. If they cut it down, they want to keep monitoring it, why don't you drop down until they hit this zone and then start applying phosphorus to stay in there. And again, you, know, you need to have a very good think about if you're going to change this, 
particularly in livestock systems, because the biggest cost is not the pig, it's the livestock. And here's where I'd like to take this work over time and start to managing the trend over rotations. We might decide that we'll build phosphorus up in the cropping phase and then draw it down in the pasture phase. And in dry systems where we don't want to surface supply P because it's not available, that might be a really good option. So this is where I want to take this work over the next few years. Uh, there's a couple of thoughts that's in your book. Don't forget the other stuff. Now, just quickly, because I do P and Lyme, this is a data set for the healthy soils, and the blue is the subsoil, the uh, yellow green colour is the 0 to 10 topsoil. Lachlan, Bidgee, Murray, east, west. And we see the same pattern, we, that we have pHs in our upper country are much lower compared to our cropping country. We tend not to have problems, and this again, if you bulk all this data and say the average of soil, sub, uh, subsoil acidity in the Murray, you know, we'll probably come out here, but the reality is that in the east it's down here, in the west it's up here. So you need to have this context around your data and make sure you're comparing apples with apples. If we turn that same data, and you check these guys, so they're the upper Murray slopes, so you just keep an eye on those guys there. So really low, so around about that 4.8, we should start to see that aluminium coming out in the solution. And basically these two data sets show it. When we look at the aluminium, there we are again. We've dropped below 4.8, bang. Up goes the aluminium, which is causing toxicity to our plants. In a cropping zone, why don't we have a problem in the cropping zone? Who doesn't lime out there? Most guys are up to, have done several rounds of lime across the country, and this is why, because it's highly economic to do so. Okay, so in the cropping zone, soil acidity is not so much an issue. We've never really had a lot of subsoil acidity. There's enough economic uh, return to make sure you never develop that and you modify your topsoil because of data like this, you know. Double wheat yield, you know, you get significant with things like you know, oats and trit, you can still get significant uh, gains by liming. Put really sensitive crops in, you can get big gains. So the economic argument for liming and cropping systems is very high and everyone does it. It's not so clear in, in pasture systems. And if you look at some of the master data, this is highly acid site for long-term trial at uh, BookBook. And if we look at the payback period, where we annual pastures, I'm sure someone will come and plug that battery in for me. The payback time for pastures is, uh, with cropping in it is quite short. Where we start to get perennial pastures, the payback period time is long. Where we put a crop in that rotation, it's short. However, so for a long time we've turned around and said that putting lime on pastures is not economic based on data like this. And there's nothing wrong with that data, uh, but when we went to pull this trial down about 20 odd years after uh, it was started, we noticed something really interesting, was that the only place where we found Phalaris was in the line plots. So if you expand your time frame to a much, much longer period, the economics might change. And so that's the current data we're going to crunch now. So again, don't just get into some interesting words from Richard Hayes about, you know, liming potentially improving soil water infiltration uh, in pastures of Goulburn, improving productivity. So I'm starting to loosen up my feeling about not liming pastures, but I'll wait till I see that data crunched. I won't go to the master data. Just quickly on lime quality, this is still an issue. Uh, this is some old work from Mark Conn. It's basically saying that, you know, until you get particle size below 0.25 millimetres or 250 microns, you know, you don't get out of this aluminium zone. So effectively, you want lime with maximum number of particles below 250 microns. Problem with that is that you don't often get it. So this is a lime survey, uh, 2003 I think it was. Uh, and I can tell you now there's a mixture of limes here from New South Wales and Victoria. And there's a difference between industry attitudes in each state. The neutralising value for all of these products is in fact isn't significantly different. So good calcium carbonate content across most of the mine material. The difference is how much money they're prepared to spend to grind it fine. And if you look at these ones here where the f number of particles that are smaller than 250 microns is significantly less, check out the dollar differences. 
you know, some of these are $198 per effective tonne versus 90. So you need to put out double the amount of super, uh, of uh, lime, to counteract that. So you need to be very careful that when you're buying lime, you're buying lime that's going to be effective, or this lime needs to be bloody cheap per tonne to compete with that. And this is still going on. So be very careful about the lime. So in, in a cropping system, liming is a no-brainer. Your biggest issue is uh, making sure you buy good lime. And don't forget, it's going to be ongoing. Every time we export product off the farm, we're taking, essentially taking alkali material off the paddock and leaving acid behind. So that's an acidifying pro process every around the world. As you produce, you acidify your soil. On highly acidic soils, that becomes a bigger problem. 70% of the acidification rate in this part of the world is, in fact, due to nitrate leaching below the root zone before we can capture it in a plant. So again, you know, we're a bit of a slave to our Mediterranean environment here. So anything we can do to improve deep drainage or reduce deep drainage and capture that nitrogen will reduce our acidification rate. A uh, couple of tools, they can't get any more. If you want to get more detail about making the standard lime is two and a half tonne a hectare, I don't know how many paddocks I've gone to where they could have fine-tuned that, more cost-effectively had the same result. You can get a manual that down the web and you can manually figure it out and I'll try and figure out how we can get this back up on the system. My finish, I always finish with this slide. Be really careful about silver bullets in agriculture. There are lots of things that are true but are relevant. Uh, there are lots of things that are potentially you know, really good but you, know, you can't adopt. Uh, all I'm saying is that you need to base your decisions on sound evidence. And for a lot of the areas we're moving into now with carbon and soil biology, there's a lot of interesting stuff in there, but there's not a lot of evidence to base a sound decision for your essentially multi-million dollar business. Done. I was just wondering, Nigel, if we could think in the future that when we sow any sort of a pasture or a grass or a crop or something like that, that we fully enclose that seed in a, in a multitude of all the nutrients and phosphorus and everything it sort of needs, like bacteria and a whole lot, whether, you know, it, it's in a micro size, but if we, if it, we could put enough around that seed that would, would sustain it, where you lose most of your phosphorus anyway, you say it gets locked up. And I'm just wondering if you could do that, what form or what would be the...